So before you hit that dislike button, give me the first five minutes of today's show to explain the title of this video. Trust me, and, and here we go with your regularly scheduled program. Sup, you beautiful bastards. Hope you've had a fantastic Tuesday. Have a great show for you today, but a quick reminder. You now have only six days left if you wanna grab something from my last drop of the year and or guilt someone into buying you a Christmas present. All on shopdefranco.com right now, you have that absolutely fantastic, emotionally exhausted blue tie-dye embroidered hoodie and shirt. Our work here is not done hoodies, the emotionally exhausted mess, the limited edition posters, and actually even more, all on shopdefranco.com. But that said, welcome back to the Philip DeFranco Show. Buckle up, hit that like button, otherwise I will punch you in the throat, and let's just jump into it. And the first thing that we're going to talk about today is story and news that explains why Dave Chappelle is telling you not to watch him. Don't do it. Please do not watch this. So if you're not aware, Chappelle's show came to Netflix a few weeks back on November 1st, which for a lot of people was very cool to see. Also seemed to make sense. Chappelle himself has a number of comedy specials that are on Netflix. Almost instantly and unsurprisingly, Chappelle's show became one of the top 10 things being consumed on Netflix in the United States. But turns out as we later learned, Chappelle was not a fan of the series being there. With Chappelle in a nearly 20 minute video that he posted of footage from a recent stand-up set on Instagram titled Unforgiven, claiming that he never got paid by Viacom's CBS, which owns the show after he left. They didn't have to pay me because I signed the contract. But is that right? I found out that these people were streaming my work and they never had to ask me or they never had to tell me. Perfectly legal because I signed the contract. But is that right? I didn't think so either. That's why I like working for Netflix. I like working for Netflix because when all those bad things happened to me, that company didn't even exist. <laughs> and when I found out they were streaming Chappelle's show, I was furious. How could they not, how could they not know? So you know what I did? I called them and I told them that this makes me feel bad. And do you wanna know what they did? They agreed that they would take it off their platform just so I could feel better. And in fact, if this morning you got on Netflix, you were like, time to watch Chappelle's show, it's not there anymore. Which is wild because it's very rare to find a story where Netflix has backed down, though back down might not be the right word. What I guess I mean to say is that Netflix had every legal and technical right to air this. And seemingly for the sake of just pleasing this one person, even who knows how big of a detriment or, or cost this was for Netflix still doing this, which once again is notable because Chappelle's show is a very valuable asset. Though in the grand scheme of things for Netflix, it probably makes sense. They have an existing relationship with Dave Chappelle. Right back in 2016, they gave him $60 million to do a three special deal. Also, probably not the best business move to be seen as a company that screwed over Dave Chappelle, given how beloved he is in the comedy community. But obviously this was a move that Chappelle appreciated and praised because they as a business beyond not only paying him, also listened to him when he was talking about removing content that he referred to as stolen goods. And also very significantly, in this clip, he also called on his fans to boycott the show and other streaming platforms that have not taken it down yet and are still not paying him. And though he didn't mention it by name, places like CBS All Access and HBO Max. I'm coming to you. I'm begging you. If you ever liked me, if you ever think there was anything worthwhile about me, I'm begging you. Please don't watch that show. I'm not asking to boycott any network. Boycott me. Boycott Chappelle's show. Do not watch it unless they pay me. And you know, that is where we are with this right now. Obviously the way Chappelle has framed this is essentially boycott me in this very specific thing regarding Chappelle's show. And I also feel like he worded it this specific way because he has been so incredibly outspoken about the, the problems with and how crazy cancel culture has gotten. But even with that said, I do wanna pass the question off to you. What are your thoughts on this story? If you're a fan of Dave Chappelle or Chappelle's show, will you make sure you don't stream it on those other platforms? Or are you of the mindset of, no, you even said you signed the contract, it's all legal, it's all fair, I'm gonna watch it. Also, regarding Netflix, what are your thoughts about the move that they just pulled right here? Are you, are you happy to see that? You think it doesn't matter, it was just business? Any and all thoughts, I'd love to hear from you. Also, actually, since we're already talking about Netflix, we should talk about the huge move they made in New Mexico. With Netflix now reportedly expanding its ABQ studios in New Mexico and committing to an additional one 
$1 billion in production spending. And this is absolutely huge entertainment news because Netflix says that it's going to make ABQ Studios one of the largest high-tech and sustainable film production facilities in North America. But uh, perhaps even more importantly and interestingly, it'll be interesting to see what happens for the state. And I mean that regarding potential economic impact as well as does New Mexico become the new place to be for film and television production. I think that's one of the signals that officials are hoping that this move sends across the industry. And I mean, hey, it's already home to current Netflix original films like The Harder They Fall and Intrusion. It's also where Netflix film projects like Army of the Dead, El Camino, Godless, Daybreak, Chambers, and Messiah. Plus, we already know that certain things are moving. We know that Stranger Things, which is normally filmed in Atlanta, Georgia, will start shooting in Albuquerque very soon. And that's already a huge deal because Stranger Things, which of course stars people like Millie Bobby Brown, Winona Ryder, and others, is arguably one of its biggest original programs. And as far as potential economic impact, it's believed that this move will create an estimated 1,000 production jobs over the next 10 years, along with 1,467 construction jobs to complete the expansion. On top of that, the studio will bring in $150 million in capital expenditures as it adds up to 10 stages, production offices, backlots, wardrobe suites, and other buildings that support production. And then, on the other end, as part of this deal, New Mexico's government is providing $17 million in funding, and the city of Albuquerque is providing another $7 million in financing, including $6 million in infrastructure in-kind financing. And in total here, New Mexico's Economic Development Department Cabinet Secretary, Alicia J. Key, said that this deal could ultimately result in $2.5 billion worth of spending in the state. So moving forward, this is definitely gonna be interesting to watch, right? To, to see if New Mexico really does compare to places like LA, New York, Atlanta, and if it proves successful, which it very likely will. It'll just further solidify Netflix as a leader in the industry. But uh, of course, these are just my thoughts, the story, and now I'd love to pass it off to you. And doubly so for those of you that are in New Mexico or other areas that are home to huge entertainment productions. But from that, I wanna share some stuff I love today and today in awesome brought to you by Omaze. You know, Omaze is a fundraising platform that gives you the chance to win once in a lifetime experiences and awesome prizes all while raising money for nonprofit organizations. And I partnered with Omaze to give you all a chance to win not only a Tesla Model 3 performance with all of the taxes and shipping included, but so much more. And the Tesla 3 performance is just one of thousands of prizes that lead up to the grand prize, a dream house in Orlando or a million dollars in cash. And for every entry to win the dream home or a million dollars, you're also eligible to win one of over 3,000 other amazing prizes. And with Omaze, your entry isn't just a chance to win. It's also a chance to support a great cause. It's a donation to support the Children's Miracle Network Hospitals, which is a nonprofit organization that supports children's hospitals across the United States and Canada, providing healthcare to 10 million kids each year. But yeah, to enter, just go to home.omaze.com slash DeFranco, or just click that link in the description down below for your chance to win and to support this great cause. And the first bit of awesome is we got a trailer and news. The Taylor Swift's concert film, Folklore, will debut tonight at midnight on Disney+. Plus. Then we got the Honest trailer for the new Mutants. We had Kristen Stewart on Stir Crazy. Then we had Binging with Babish on The Burger Show. And the final bit of awesome today is Ready Player Two is out. Also, I'm not saying that it is awesome. I hope that it is. I'm just very excited to actually now consume it. I really enjoyed the first book. I'm hopeful with the second book. And also, if, if you like the movie, you should definitely read the novel. There are a number of differences that I think you might enjoy. And if you want to see the full versions of everything I just shared, the secret link of the day, really anything at all, links as always are in the description down below. And then let's talk about a story that it's yet another example of something that constantly happens and it, it grinds my gears. I'll cover something on a show, I'll release that show, and then within an hour of the episode being released, some update will happen that completely changes the story. And yesterday, that actually happened twice. One, uh, Belle Delphine, who we talked about yesterday, her account on YouTube was actually reinstated. So hey, a win as far as treating mainstream artists, the same as more independent artists, but also we need to keep in mind it only happened after a lot of uh, concerted backlash. So I still worry about the smaller creators there, but then also two, after two weeks, after dozens of lawsuits, the government has finally now begun the process of allowing Joe Biden's transition to the presidency. And this, even though Donald Trump is still not conceding, though that might be because he doesn't know what that word means. I'm kidding, he knows what that means, which is why it's also more troubling. But the main thing, yesterday we saw the administrator of the GSA, the General Services Administration, Emily Murphy, admitting in a letter that Biden was the quote, apparent president-elect. And as far as why the GSA is important here, why you've even had to know that a human being by the name of Emily Murphy exists and in the near future can go back to not caring that she exists, is that the GSA is an independent agency within the government that has the power to direct the flow of transition resources to an incoming president. Right, it's not controlled by 
by the executive branch, though it is technically part of it. And while Murphy was appointed by Trump, the agency is not part of the Trump administration. Yet, after it was clear that Biden had won the presidency, Murphy initially refused to sign the letter allowing Biden to begin his transition process, right? Which, understand, is something that is usually considered a very standard call. Something that has also kept Joe Biden in the dark regarding key issues like COVID-19, which, like we talked about yesterday, is an issue because him not getting those resources, him not getting into the process, that could cost countless lives. And so from there, you had a ton of people accusing Murphy, who was a former attorney for the Republican National Committee, of being influenced by the White House. However, in her letter from last night, now declaring Biden the apparent winner, she says, I have dedicated much of my adult life to public service, and I have always strived to do what is right. Please know that I came to my decision independently based on the law and available facts. I was never directly or indirectly pressured by any executive branch official, including those who work at the White House or GSA, with regard to the substance or timing of my decision. With Murphy also noting in this letter that she had, quote, received threats online, by phone, and by mail, directed at my safety, my family, my staff, and even my pets in an effort to coerce me into making this determination prematurely. And as far as why Murphy took so long to sign this letter, according to the Washington Post, those close to her said she wanted more certainty before making the call, apparently wanting to see battleground states actually begin certifying their elections, wanting to see how Trump's legal battles would play out. With the Post also noting that there was the prospect of becoming the target of Trump's anger, which while I personally have issue with Emily Murphy dragging her feet in a time that once again could cost American lives if there is a delayed response from the Biden administration because they were not able to access key information ahead of time, there is a hard to imagine amount of backlash for anyone that previously supported Trump doing anything that hurts the president. I mean, hell, even Tucker Carlson in the past week was called a traitor. That over his coverage of Sidney Powell, who the Trump administration has now even kind of had distance themselves from. Because apparently in 2020, there is actually a level that is still considered too crazy. But that said, going back to Emily Murphy, regarding Trump's reaction to this news, he actually didn't go after Murphy. Though he did appear to almost immediately contradict a thing that Emily Murphy claimed. With Trump tweeting, our case strongly continues. We will keep up the a good fight and I believe we will prevail. Nevertheless, in the best interest of our country, I am recommending that Emily and her team do what needs to be done with regard to initial protocols and have told my team to do the same. But okay, there's two things there. One, no, your case is not strong. We've literally seen case after case after case fail to hold up in court. And two, in that statement, it appears that he's kind of taking credit here for Murphy's decision to kickstart this process. Pretty much at the same time that Murphy insisted that she had acted on her own. And in fact, according to the Washington Post, Murphy's team even told the White House Counsel's Office on Friday that she planned to designate Biden the winner on Monday. But then adding they just never heard back from the White House Counsel's Office. Now, because Murphy's letter gives Biden several notable resources, including access to millions in federal funds, it is important to talk about what comes next. And part of the answer there is that President-elect Biden and his team are now able to begin holding meetings with government agencies to discuss policy ahead of his inauguration. Actually, on the note of government agencies, we should talk about what that will look like under a Biden administration because Joe Biden has now started to reveal several of his cabinet picks. In fact, on Sunday, Biden announced Tony Blinken as his Secretary of State. Notably, Blinken is the former Deputy Secretary of State under President Obama, and unsurprisingly, as far as policy, uh, Blinken is going to be a very big departure from current Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. Right, Blinken has been highly critical of Trump's quote, America first policy, saying that it's only isolated the United States and in fact created opportunities and vacuums for its adversaries. And there, he's expected to help the United States rejoin major international agreements that Trump took us out of, right? Things you think of uh, the Paris Climate Accord, the Iran nuclear deal, the World Health Organization. Yesterday, we also got the news that Biden has chosen Alejandro Mayorkas as his Secretary of Homeland Security, which uh, actually like Blinken, he was Deputy Secretary under Obama. Also having previously served as the Director of U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services, and as a Cuban American, he will be the first Latino to lead the department, which is also notable because he's expected to overhaul most, if not all, of Trump's hardline immigration policies. Mayorkas even saying on Twitter yesterday, when I was very young, the United States provided my family and me a place of refuge. Now I have been nominated to be the DHS Secretary and oversee the protection of all Americans and those who flee persecution in search of a better life for themselves and their loved ones. Also, among other notable picks, you have Jeanette Yellen as Treasury Secretary. She previously served served as the chair of the Federal Reserve under Obama, but was not reappointed by Trump after he won the 2016 election. Also, if Yellen's confirmed by the Senate, she would become the country's first female treasury secretary. Then, regarding climate change, former Secretary of State John Kerry has been tapped to become the special presidential envoy for climate. With the Biden transition team noting, this marks the first time that the National Security Council will include an official dedicated to climate change, reflecting the president-elect's commitment to addressing climate change as an urgent national security issue. And in addition to that, Biden has chosen Jake Sullivan as his national security 
security advisor, which is actually a position that he also held for Biden in a vice presidential capacity during part of Obama's second term. With Sullivan also having played a key role in negotiations around the 2015 Iran nuclear deal. But yeah, that's where this story ends. And I thought today it'd be more beneficial to look at our perspective future rather than spend a bulk of the time on the continued efforts of Trump to deny reality and just general flailing, which I will say today took the form of Donald Trump retweeting and quote tweeting, definitely not crazy person, Randy Quaid, which included videos that looked like this right here, which is a very normal thing. Definitely nothing alarming or embarrassing there. And that is where I'm going to end today's show. As always, for the three of you still here, thank you for being a part of my daily dives in the news. Also, if one of you are new here, hit that subscribe button, definitely tap that bell so you get all notifications. Also, remember you only have six days left to grab something at shopdefranco.com. But with that said, of course, as always, my name's Philip DeFranco. You've just been filled in. I love yo faces and I'll see you tomorrow.